Okay. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Alex Vines and I'm Director of Area Studies and International Law here at Chatham House. So you're very welcome uh, to this meeting today on the big picture on small states. How can the Commonwealth's small states navigate global challenges? This is a meeting that we're doing in partnership with the Common, uh, Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative and the Director of the uh, Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative will say some words of introduction in a moment. I'd like to just remind you that this is also being live streamed, so all sorts of people who are not in the room will be watching us too, and they're very welcome, so welcome to Chatham House. Um, you can comment via Twitter, so using the hashtag CH uh, events, so hashtag CH events, but also the hashtag, the, the, the Twitter account of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, so hashtag CHRI at CHOGM, Commonwealth Heads of Government. Other than that, uh, this is obviously being live streamed. Uh, you might be at Chatham House, but you don't need to know anything about the Chatham House rule. It's <laughs> fully transparent and fully accountable, which is how we like it. So um, it's all on the record. So with no more ado, I think I'd just like to invite the International Director of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, Sanjoy Hazarika, just to say a few words about what this is about and why CHRI has partnered with Chatham House. Sanjoy. Please. Thank you. Well, on behalf of CHRI, uh, I'd like to add my uh, welcome to all of you here, uh, to the panel for taking part in this uh, program. Uh, and uh, our special, special thanks to Chatham House for hosting uh, this uh, panel discussion, and particularly Dr. Alex Fines for chairing the session. I'd like to welcome Senator Concetta Fioravanti Wells, the Minister for International Development Australia, Lord Bates, Minister of State uh, Diffid, uh, Dr. Patsy Robertson, who is extremely well known across the Commonwealth um, and chair of the Ramphal Institute, chair of the Commonwealth Association, and Dr. Carolyn Morris, uh, senior director uh, and co-director of the Small States Program at uh, Queen, Mary's. Queen Mary's, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. 31 out of 53 Commonwealth members are small states. That's countries with a population of less than 1.5 million. These states face a unique set of challenges, limited economic and human resources, inadequate access to international systems, and political constraints imposed by the reliance on the support of larger states. Despite such overwhelming challenges supported by the Commonwealth, these states have been key in the est establishment of institutional mechanisms such as the International Criminal Court. CHRI itself is working for greater inclusion and participation of small states in the UNHRC and its subsidiary mechanisms, and working towards building capacity of, cap of Commonwealth small state missions in Geneva by training diplomats to engage effectively with HRC mechanisms, such as the UPR and special procedures. In addition, as a Commonwealth leading civil society organization, and in partnership with groups such as Civicus, we seek to bring the need for stakeholders to engage, not just with international organizations, but with human rights and climate change issues at home. We believe at the heart of this unique, innovative initiative that it's critical to have good, uh, good governance and transparency at home, upholding the rights of citizens and ensuring that the fundamentals of access to justice and information Balancing and connecting international obligations with domestic accountability also there. I look forward to this discussion because it's a forerunner, really, to the issues facing small states, uh, which will be at the forefront of the agenda at Chogam this week. Thank you. Sanjoy, thank you very much for the introduction. So for those who just came in, just a reminder that this is a public meeting, it's fully on the record, and we're just about to dis uh, start discussing the big picture on small states. How can the Commonwealth's small states navigate global challenges? Well, the first person on our panel is Conchetra Fiavanti Wells, and she's the Minister for International Development and the Pacific in Australia's Federal 
coalition government. She has served as a senator for New South Wales since 2005. So she was sworn in as Minister for International Development and the Pacific in February 2016. Obviously, the Pacific, there are a lot of small states there. So, Minister, I imagine that you have thought and dealt a lot with the challenges of small states and thought about how can the Commonwealth small states navigate global challenges. Over to you. Well, thank you, and thank you very much. Can I start by acknowledging my panellists and thank Chatham House for this um, opportunity. Um, the question um, at the heart of our meeting today is basically, can the small states of the Commonwealth navigate the biggest challenges of our time, which are basically global in nature? And this, of course, is critically uh, important. Terrorism, climate change, sustaining economic growth, the impact of rapid technological change, sharper and sharper um, competition for agriculture and resource stocks, these issues confront small island states or SIDS um, just as much as they do uh, developing uh, or developed uh, countries. Now, of course, Australia is a very large, it's one of the world's largest uh, islands, and we live between two oceans, the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. And of course, uh, these areas, the Indo-Pacific is very much home to a very diverse range of nations and of course none uh, as diverse as uh, in the uh, Pacific. Now of course um, the Commonwealth is composed of countries that are um, ranging from small nations to large nations um, like uh, Australia, from wealthy nations to um, the most vulnerable countries participating in the global economy. And we, of course, are very conscious of this uh, diversity, which is very much a feature of the Pacific region. Many of our neighbours face challenges that are very different to our own, and those challenges are common to many of the SIDS um, globally. Uh, and they're generally small economies with a very narrow industrial base. They often have small populations, and of course, this makes it harder for those, uh, for SIDS to get the economies uh, of scale, the global competitiveness, particularly in a world uh, where increasingly we are seeing trade uh, protectionism. Often they are geographically distant from key trading partners, therefore making it very expensive uh, for them to effectively get their goods um, to market. Now, given the realities of our global uh, geography, SIDS are more often than not vulnerable uh, to the dangers of natural disaster, whether they be earthquakes, cyclones, or other devastating events. According to the 2017 uh, World um, Risk Index, five of the 15 most risk countries are in the Pacific. And just in the last months, um, we've seen cyclones, uh, three cyclones um, hit. Uh, the Pacific uh, G uh, Gita, uh, Josie and Kenny and indeed um, we were supposed to have uh, Prime Minister Baini Marama with us uh, today but I'm sure the Prime Minister at the moment has uh, issues and we've got cyclones uh, certainly very much uh, hitting Fiji um, at the moment. Of course SIDS have small uh, budgets making them subject to a greater degree of fiscal risk um, than those faced by larger and more diverse uh, economies. And of course, this in turn limits the capacity of SIDS to respond to global or local shocks. Governance uh, can be a significant challenge and modest resources often spread vast and remote um, locations can make it difficult to achieve the sort of education and health outcomes that we in the developed in we in developed nations very much take for granted. So that's why, from Australia's perspective, our overseas development assistance uh, is around the four billion Australian dollar mark. Ninety percent of our ODA is actually spent in the Indo-Pacific, and a third of that directly in the Pacific. And we have chosen to target uh, our spending uh, very much in what we call our backyard, our neighbourhood. This is very a clear priority uh, of our foreign affairs uh, white paper, which was recently received, uh, uh, released. The stability, prosperity and security of our region is second only to the defence of Australia. And so therefore we share very much uh, uh, our interest in ensuring particularly our Pacific partners lift their economic growth. 
uh, and prosperity. Now, that's for that reason, Australia has stepped up its engagement in the Pacific. It's one of our major foreign um, policy objectives. And um, if you look at our ODA uh, investment amongst Commonwealth countries, six out of the top 10 recipients are SIDS. And the number, uh, number one recipient, of course, is Papua New Guinea. Uh, we invest um, our funds in this way, not only because um, Australians are uh, generous, we believe in supporting our neighbours, but more importantly, this is for us an important way of achieving very important sustainable development goals, which are not just uh, in our regional interests, but more importantly, in our own national interest. Um, now, it is not in our interest to see SIDS um, locked out of global engagement and for them to become more um, uh, more vulnerable to the risk of instability or economic failure. And it is important that develop development priorities um, do take into account the priorities of those SIDS, but at the same time do not impose on them unnecessary debt burdens. Um, I just wanted just to touch on some of the things that Australia has targeted in terms of its assistance to SIDS in Geneva and New York. Um, our funding for the Commonwealth Small States uh, Offices has allowed small island countries like Kiribati and Samoa to represent their interests to, um, at uh, in international fora and contribute to, um, to make their contribution to our international rules-based order. Uh, we are proud to help our Pacific Island countries and we support their efforts and their economies to adapt, particularly in a post-climate um, world. In recent uh, years, we've helped a small range. Um, you know, we not only help uh, in health, in education, in governance, uh, in a whole range of different areas, food security, economic and climate issues, but also law and order and governance and security. Uh, for example, as part of our regional assistance mission to the Solomon Islands, um, we made um, this mission, which was a regional mission, made a, um, an enormous contribution to peace and security uh, in our area. Um, and now that it's concluded, it ran for 14 years. Yes, at a cost of about $2 billion for Australia, but today it is the forerunner now to what we will now be developing in the Pacific, which is a regional Pacific security framework called Bikatawa Plus. Now, recognising rising sea levels uh, will affect Commonwealth countries, both large um, and small, and this is an issue of fundamental importance to Australia, and most especially to our region. Now, of course, the legal implications of sea level rise are not explicitly addressed in the UN uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea. And um, we in Australia remain firmly committed to the international rules-based order under UNCLOS. And we have demonstrated this through our recent um, agreement on maritime boundaries with Timor-Leste, which was the first conciliation of its kind conducted through UNCLOS's dispute settlement procedures. We are committed to working, uh, particularly with our Pacific Island uh, countries, to consider the legal uncertainties um, that arise and uh, may be caused by sea level rises. Now, we want to play a constructive voice in this discussion, and we hope that this issue will be uh, raised at the next Pacific Island Forum. We are a long-standing partner in helping Pacific Island countries formalise their maritime boundaries consistent with UNCLOS through our Pacific Maritime Boundaries uh, project. And since 2011, we have supported Pacific Island countries to determine 15 shared maritime boundary agreements and establish maritime zones. And last, um, last year, we committed additional funds to support um, Pacific Island countries determining remaining uh, maritime uh, boundaries. Uh, we believe that establishing um, maritime boundaries is the first step in addressing the challenges presented by climate change and uh, the effects of potential sea level rises. Can I just conclude by saying that uh, clearly uh, we are here to talk about SIDS, but of course SIDS is vitally important uh, um, and small island developing states are very important in our Pacific region. And so I've wanted to focus my comments uh, on our neighbourhood. And 
as a member of the Pacific family, we share very much the common uh, interest in working together to ensure a stable and secure uh, region. And uh, we certainly look forward uh, to working with um, through um, some of these issues and having the opportunity to raise them uh, in this very important forum. So thank you very, very much. Conchetta, thanks very much for your presentation. So that was our first panellist. We're moving on to our second, who's on my left. And the second panellist is Lord Bates. He was appointed as a Minister of State at the Department of International Development in October 2016. He was previously a Minister of State at the Home Office from May 2015 until March 2016. Welcome to Chatham House, Lord Bates. Over to you. Thank you for hosting this event. And uh, it's a great privilege to be here. And, uh, to be on such a, an impressive uh, panel as you've already heard. The very uh, interesting sort of introduction which was given about the number of uh, small states within the Commonwealth is 31 right at the beginning uh, by uh, uh, our co-hosts, uh, I think uh, underscores the importance of this particular uh, meeting. And this is in fact my first uh, Chogham engagement of what is going to be a very uh, exciting week for us. I know that some of the panelists have already clocked up uh, two or three uh, working their way through the, uh, uh, the, the traffic, but this is, uh, th this is my first and I'm delighted for that reason uh, that uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, the one which I'm able to open on. I want to first of all pay tribute uh, to the uh, 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 Commonwealth Human Rights Institute for their work in championing the issues of voice and engagement of small states, including through the international institutions such as the Human Rights Council. I want to thank small island states for their contribution to international efforts such as their role in establishing the International Criminal Court, the UN Convention of the Law and the Sea, which we've just been hearing about, and their energy and drive in securing the Paris Agreement in 2015. It's important that the Commonwealth recognises the perspectives of small states across all of its summit themes, and this is an opportunity to amplify the voice of small states. The UK recognises a very important role that the Commonwealth plays in supporting small states in many areas, for example, climate change, governance, elections and transparency. The UK also understands the specific vulnerabilities that small states face. We all witnessed the devastation wrought across the Caribbean by hurricanes Irma and Maria in 2017. Dominica had over 200% of their annual GDP wiped out overnight. No small island can reasonably be expected to recover and rebuild from a catastrophic disaster that undermines their entire economy without international uh, support. And I'm proud that the UK uh, was a, a leading responder uh, to that particular disaster. And I want to praise the actions of Commonwealth members who offered assistance after that terrible and unprecedented uh, disaster. Six months on, the UK are continuing to provide assistance to vulnerable communities and new reconstruction projects are underway. And our development program is focused on building resilience across the region. And our particular passion on that is to actually build back better. And finally, I'm really keen to, hold, uh, to hear from this forum what role you think the Commonwealth can play in supporting uh, small states. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lord Bates. Well, our next panelist uh, is a veteran of Shoggams, I believe. She uh, was the former Director of Information at the Commonwealth Secretariat and the official spokesperson of the Commonwealth from 1983 to 1994. So Pat Patsy Robertson is well placed not only to discuss uh, the challenges of small states, but also about the relevance of the Commonwealth uh, for, for the challenges that we've been discussing on this uh, panel. Patsy, welcome back to Chatham House. Thank you. It's always good to have you here. Uh, I'm very uh, looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you very much. Well, I think what I should try to do is to give you a perspective of what it is like to be a small state in a cruel and quite um, ruthless world. The whole point is that um, small states are not big states writ small. They're small in size, small in population, small in, in what they produce for trade, and when they do educate their, their people, they tend to migrate. So there's always, they're always small in having the right number of trained people to take over the burden of running even a small state. 
Um, so what Small States did, and I think that's the best decision they made, is that they decided to stay in the Commonwealth. I mean, many people say, why, why did countries stay in the Commonwealth? The point, whole point is, when you leave the British Empire to become independent, as I said before, you don't have diplomats, you don't have links, and the Commonwealth provided that. And the early meetings of, of Commonwealth leaders, you're having one in London today, went on for four or five days. It was like, like think in, think tanks, where leaders could sit across the table and ask questions and get answers and make friends. And you know, um, they brought some of the difficulties which now face the world to the table. For instance, it was the Prime Minister of the Maldives who at his very first meeting, I can't remember the date, but it must have been in the, in the 80s, um, said, you know, we are, we, are, we, are, we are going to sink if, if the world doesn't do something about sea level rise. They were seeing sea, sea level rises um, rising so long ago. And the then Secretary General, Shridhar Ramphal, he, he did a lot of, of, of specialist um, um, people, brought a lot of people who knew, and prepared a report which Commonwealth governments then took to the UN. Commonwealth established a small state's office um, to help uh, small countries have representation at the UN. You know, they, they didn't have the civil servants. So I think, you know, the Commonwealth, and the Commonwealth is still playing an immense role in looking at the problems, in raising the issue of the problems of, of uh, these countries. I mean, the, the whole point about the Commonwealth is that it is really, well, it's a family that doesn't probably always get on very well with everybody, but you know, Families, you feel if you're in a family, you can approach anybody. I remember very many years ago, you know, they meet up on all levels, finance ministers, health ministers, trade ministers. So if you were a trade minister coming from, say, Antigua in the Caribbean, maybe what, 200,000 people? If there are any Antiguans here, please correct me. <laughs> 200,000 people, you know, you can, you can discuss it with the British Chancellor before they go on to the World Bank or the IMF. And I do remember, this rather dates me, where when Roy Jenkins was the British Chancellor, and at that time British, British um, journalists did follow the Commonwealth more closely than they do now. And he met the British press, and then he looked around, and in the other room, the kind of ragtag and bobtail other Commonwealth ministers were busy chatting and laughing. And he said to his private secretary, now what shall I do? And the private secretary said, circulate minister, circulate, go, meaning go in there and talk even to the finance minister of a small country. And that, you know, that created, uh, gave these small states a lot of confidence. And over the years, they have been able to participate in fighting um, apartheid in Southern Africa and bringing, ending racism in Southern Africa. And that was only done because they were in the Commonwealth. It's not, they, they, they couldn't, they couldn't do it through the UN because the whole issue of racism and apartheid, India raised it when they became independent in what, 1947? And it wasn't until the Commonwealth took it up seriously in 1965 and worked very hard at it with the support of countries like Australia and Canada, New Zealand, India, Malaysia, you know, a, a microcosm as we say of the world, all races, all religions, all levels of, of development. Um, at the present moment, the, what is happening in the world is vitally important. The Commonwealth is doing a lot of work today as we speak. They've now just set up an innovation hub to help um, small states. It's all, on, it's all on the web, which I don't quite understand myself, but maybe <laughs> some, of you, some of you will, where they can, they can track what is happening, get information, and be able to make a, make a, a contribution. And part of this innovation hub is that it will help to train some of the people in these small states to, to, to become um, more expert in, in, the, in the challenges which this world wide web, this whole new, new world we live in. Um, and it will help them track their trade, it will help them track um, um, what's happening in the, in the environment, um, and, and that is just being set up with, with the help of a, of a global fund. Um, so
So therefore, I want to leave with you that um, small states, the Commonwealth is the best home for small states. Um, they are coming here to meetings. They're going to meet, sit with, um, meet with the British Prime Minister. Um, and they are going to be able to, s to tell what, they need, what needs to be done. For instance, Caribbean states are taking up today, or in a few days' time, the whole problem of, of people who came here to help Britain after the war. And now, f having worked here, never bothered to get a passport, Jamaica became independent, and um, they're facing deportation under the new rules. But you know, it's going to be discussed, although it, the papers say Mrs. May doesn't want to do it, but they're going to raise it in the meeting, and they'll get support from a great number of countries. Now, where else could they get that support? So the message I want to leave with you is that small states, and now they're all, certainly Caribbean and countries, dependent on remittances. People who, these people here who are facing deportation, they have educated families, they have sent money back. My country, Jamaica, biggest foreign exchange earner is from remittances in, in Britain, Canada, and the UK. That came about because of, of, of Commonwealth links. Um, and, and the future is not bad for small states. They are creative. They have their music, which sells all over the world. They're creative people. They have, this morning at the opening of the forum, the People's Forum, there was lovely poetry from um, somebody from the Caribbean, from um, um, New Zealand, and Malaysia. Um, you know, where else in the world are you ever going to get that? At a meeting which ostensibly is supposed to be about high political issues. The Commonwealth has debt and it has this huge risk. 53 countries, how many people? Two, two billion, no, no two billion is, is not, in, yeah. well, India has 1.2, 1. 1. so yes, two billion people. Um, links which go back a very long time and which are still very useful. Thank you. Patsy, thank you very much. <laughs> We're on to our last panelist who is Caroline Morris, and she joined Queen Mary University of London as a lecturer in public law in 2010. She's had various other uh, jobs as, uh, as an academic, but you should also know that she's had a life before being an academic when she was a uh, judicial assistant to Lord Wolfe at the Court of Appeal and then a legal advisor at the New Zealand Ministry of Justice. Caroline, welcome to Chatham House. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. Um, so. What I wanted to do, first of all, was just tell you a little bit about the Centre for Small States. The Centre for Small States is based in the Department of Law at Queen Mary University of London, and I founded it in 2015, um, primarily because I thought that there was a large gap in the legal world in that it wasn't, not that it wasn't even taking small states seriously, but it really wasn't considering the unique position of small states at all, and I felt that something needed to be done about that. So I founded the centre a few years ago. Um, it is, to my knowledge, the uh, first and at the moment only um, university research centre that takes a legal perspective on the challenges and opportunities for small states. We use the Commonwealth Secretariat's definition of, of a small state in um, in thinking about small states. But we also include um, other small jurisdictions, so the British Overseas Territories, other non-sovereign entities, um, countries in free association with, with larger states because of the commonalities that they share with, with small states. And we work quite closely with other academic research centres um, in Europe uh, who look at small states from the perspective of international relations and economic development. So that's just a little flavor of um, what the center is and what our focus is. And now I'd like to turn to, I think, what is now the very familiar language of vulnerability and resilience that is used when we talk about small states. And to first talk about the challenges where I'm going to echo what some of the previous speakers have said. 
Um, we know that small states, for many reasons, uh, face a number of, of challenges that are not shared to the same extent by larger states or um, will affect them to the same degree. And obviously, environmental concerns are a major one of those, climate change and natural disasters in particular, but we also um, know that small states face concerns in relation to um, sustainable energy, uh, pollution, um, access to energy reserves, and so on. Um, secondly, I know that migration has been um, mentioned by my fellow panelists as well, particularly outwards um, migration in the form of um, climate refugees, but also brain drain, um, both of which can severely affect a country's ability to um, maintain resilience in the face of particular challenges. And from the Centre for Small States uh, perspective, um, at the moment one of the things that we're focusing on is the challenge of sovereignty for small states. And under the umbrella of sovereignty, we think there are a, a number of challenges that small states are facing at the moment. And we're looking at this from two perspectives. The first one are questions of external sovereignty. So how do small states work through their relationships with other states? So larger neighbours in the same region, what are their geopolitical uh, relationships with those countries? Um, but also, um, in particular, for small states, um, the small states of the Caribbean and the Pacific um, within the Commonwealth, what is their relationship with their former uh, colonizer? So how do they work through that post-colonial state and how does that affect their legal system? So what do you do in a country where you have um, a Westminster Parliament, but it also has to take into account customary legal practices? There's a degree of complexity there uh, that a lot of small states are facing. Um, Another aspect of external sovereignty is the question of economic sovereignty. So how will small states survive? Um, questions of trade, how do they deal with trade imbalances, questions of specialisation, particularly because they have limited natural resources, so we often see small states moving into financial services, um, online gambling, or other more innovative ways of generating revenue um, than traditional products. Um, and also central to that, I think, is the question of development. As you said, remittances are, are a large um, source of economic revenue for small states, but of course, when you're relying on remittances, you don't have those people in your own country to help build up the, the economy. So that's something we think small states are also facing. The other side of the coin in terms of sovereignty are questions of internal sovereignty. And this is, this is my particular interest as a public law academic. I mean, as my Australian um, uh, fellow panellists said, good governance is something that is a critical issue that we think small states are facing. So simply lack of population, small size of population, and the fact that the brightest and best often go overseas and then don't come back, um, can cause problems with the capacity of the public service, um, the small size of the, um, of the legal community can create problems with judicial independence or compliance with legal ethics, and you might also get um, problems with electoral integrity as well. So we think that internal sovereignty, how a small state manages itself as a sovereign entity, is a challenge that um, needs to be, to be looked at. Um, so, so much for the, for the vulnerabilities. I do want to end on a, on a positive note and come back to the um, other side of the, the coin that we use when we talk about small states, and that's the question of resilience. And I wanted just to mention briefly some of the things that the centre has been doing in terms of working with small states to help them build up their resilience to some of those challenges. I want to stress that we are absolutely not in a position of telling small states what to do, um, but we hope to work with small states and other organisations working with small states to empower small states to face these challenges. So the first thing that we see ourselves um, as providing is a meeting place meeting place for people to develop a community 
of lawyers, legal academics, and of course others um, who are interested in small states simply because we know that a lot of work is done through personal relations, and I think that's particularly important in small states. When you come from somewhere where things are done through personal connections, where everybody tends to know everybody else or knows someone who knows someone who knows you, <laughs> um, we think that building those personal connections and creating a place where those can be made is, is very important. Um, secondly, we see ourselves as a meeting place for ideas. So a space where people can think about legal concepts and what they mean for small states. What does it mean for a small state when it's told, well, you must comply with the rule of law? What does it mean for a small state when it's confronting questions of human rights? Um, the second thing that we see ourselves as being able to offer is the provision of legal expertise to small states. So some of the things that we've recently done um, are to um, provide, um, put the IMF in contact with experts in the law of the sea for some of their work on the Indian Ocean states. We've um, put forward legal drafters to work with small jurisdictions such as the Falkland Islands and small states uh, such as Fiji where um, some of our colleagues did work on Fiji's uh, very recent Arbitration Act. And uh, we've provided advice to the Seychelles um, Constitutional Court um, on an election bribery case. And then the last thing that, that we're working on, um, and because we're very new, we're still working on this, is the uh, issue of building capacity, which again, I think is really important to be mentioned by everyone as something that needs to be done. So we're providing workshops, um, for example, this year, training judges and other legal decision makers on um, working in environmental disputes. So we want to work with that challenge of natural disasters or disputes over resources and um, help empower small states to develop their capacity to deal with those sorts of issues. So that's a little bit about the centre, um, probably more than enough about the challenges, but about how the centre is working um, to help um, build the resilience of small states. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to, um, to your questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, so just a reminder, if you've joined us recently, either through live streaming or in the, in, in the hall here, that this meeting is fully on the record. Not only that, but if you want to tweet, you're most welcome to do that, to send a comment. So hashtag CHEvents or hashtag CHRI at CHOGM. So we have time now for a conversation. There's a panel waiting eagerly here. Um, who wants to join a bigger conversation about this? We'll go for the gentleman right in the front row. Congratulations, so you're sitting in business class. You've got extra leg room. <laughs> These seats aren't that comfortable. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Danny Sreeskandaraja from Civicus. Uh, thank you for this panel. I think it's clear about the track record of the Commonwealth on working with to support small island states. And also perhaps we've got hints of the potential, but I wanted to talk about resources. Um, for me to fulfill anywhere like the potential that the Commonwealth has to support small island states, uh, we need Commonwealth institutions that are not just more effective, but much better resourced. I mean, the combined budgets of all of the various governmental and non-governmental Commonwealth organizations probably won't total more than a few tens of millions of, of pounds. Uh, and my fear is in a week like this when we'll hear lots of warm words about the importance of the Commonwealth, that we're going to underachieve on the Commonwealth's ability to, to actually you know, deliver on this potential unless we invest in these organizations. Um, and I don't know, you know in, in Australia, I know you've had falling levels of ODA in the UK despite the 0.7 commitment being met. The, the, the risk perhaps is that in search of, of delivery and, and bigger programs that the interests of Commonwealth actors or indeed Commonwealth small island states may be um, forsaken. So I, I wanted to ask, well, is it realistic to think that the Commonwealth may once again attract relatively sizable financial resources from those states that support it to do the sorts of work that you're all clearly interested in? Okay, thanks Danny. Let's uh, deal with resources and resourcing these issues uh, with the panel. Lord Bates. Well, I. I suppose I would begin by saying that we're, we're, 
whenever you're having a debate about uh, resources, of course, it, it's never enough. It, it could always be more, and I think that that has to be said, and we recognize that. But uh, if you look for the, the latest statistics which are available as to uh, what the UK, through its overseas development assistance, uh, is providing, um, three and a half billion pounds to Commonwealth uh, countries as a whole. In addition, we have uh, a significant CDC investment uh, program, uh, which uh, is uh, around about 500 uh, to 600 million uh, pounds in private companies to help build uh, capacity. Then when you look into what we've been doing, particularly in the small island states, uh, mentioned about the Caribbean, I think that uh, uh, most people, even the ones who would argue that there ought to be more might, would probably recognize that uh, the UK response was, was, was rightly, because of the scale of the need, you know, very uh, significant uh, uh, to that uh, in you know, numbers in terms of over uh, 100 million. There are other programs uh, there, in, particularly in the Caribbean, on the infrastructure uh, fund. But um, I think it comes back to another uh, point which was uh, referred to earlier by Patsy, which is to say that increasingly the need of small island states is in the need of knowledge and access to scientific knowledge, uh, the cutting edge uh, facilities that we can share. And we have things like uh, the Commonwealth Marine Economies Program, uh, which is trying to do just that, providing the share better uh, uh, data. So whilst I always accept that there will always be a demand to do more, I think certainly from the UK's point of view, we recognise we would like to claim that we are we're doing a significant amount <coughs> already. Sanderson. Um, thank you. Uh, look, uh, just a couple of points following on from what Lord Bates said. Uh, from Australia, similar situation. I mean, we're about $1.2 billion of our uh, ODA went to Commonwealth countries. Um, I actually think that um, there's another angle to this. It's about partnerships and it's about um, expanding partnerships and looking at ways that different Commonwealth countries can work with each other. Now, um, often um, Australia is in an area of the Indo-Pacific, so we clearly have um, a part of the world, which is not only a very disaster prone one, but one where we have about 36 of the 53 um, Commonwealth countries are actually in the Indo-Pacific area. So therefore, uh, partnerships have become very important uh, for Australia. I think what's also uh, vital is that often with overseas development assistance, it's not a question of quantity, it's actually a, uh, it's a question of targeting and ensuring that your aid is effective, um, it's efficient, uh, and it's also achieving um, the priorities that you and um, the country to which you are giving assistance, um, those priorities um, are met. So from our perspective, um, I think as, as, as Lord Bates said, um, there is a very important component with a Commonwealth where you've got 60% of the Commonwealth is 30 years or under. Um, there is, I almost say, a responsibility for countries, the larger countries, to ensure that we meet a very important um, objective, and that is capacity building and education. And on that front, uh, Australia has strongly supported scholarships, um, capacity building, um, and, but also, if I can say, uh, as uh, it was said uh, earlier, uh, remittances and affording people the opportunity of labour mobility, and that's something that Australia has done. We've had a whole range of different programs, uh, but more importantly, to ensure that your labour mobility programs are not just targeted in terms of just the money that is remitted, and indeed from Australia, uh, about two and a half billion dollars is remitted every year to the Pacific and about a billion to Africa. Um, but it's about building capacity. So it's not just about quantity. I think there's a quality component of this, and that, that component is that capacity building, and that's very much a feature of what Australia does uh, in our region um, through a whole range of different things. Thank you. Can I just add something? Yeah, please. That it's not always about money. Granted that the, there's very little money sloshing around, say, for the Commonwealth Secretariat now. But you see, for, there are so many organizations which bring Commonwealth people together. For instance, we have here the Secretary General of the Commonwealth um, Parliamentary Association. 
No, he brings parliamentarians and, and they get training and they discuss. There is the Commonwealth um, magistrates and lawyers. You know, these are important um, people who help to help a country to govern properly. Um, the present Secretary General is aware that she's not going to get much more money than the little she's got. Um, and that's why she's decided one of her key things is going to be partnership. And I just mentioned briefly this innovative partnership with the Global GIF, Global Innovation fund. They've got the money, and as they said, honey, we've got the people. Okay? <laughs> and um, so that they're going to... <laughs> 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 um, and they're going... And it was a lady who announced it, who came from the GIS. Um, and they're going to target young people, the bright young people who from their babies are, and, and go into their whole business of cyber, whatever. I'm, I have to tell you, I'm quite illiterate about it. But, you know, for instance, security cyber security, getting to know what's happening in the world, training people. That is happening, and that's the way the Commonwealth is helping, with support from, from the, the governments which, which, are, which give money to keep the secretary going. But the, she's, she's forming links with you know, a huge amount of international. The World Bank is giving the secretariat money now to do special projects. So all is not lost. You can still do a lot without without a lot of money. I hope somebody here will, maybe this Commonwealth Parliament will say, we have no money, but we're doing great work. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to chip in at all, Caroline? No, I don't. Yeah, fine. I, yeah. Okay, so uh, the lady down there, first of all, yep, with the green jacket, yep. No, no, no. Thanks. Susie Allegre from the Island Rights Initiative. And thanks very much for the presentations. Um, and my question is about human rights, which can often be quite difficult to deal with in small states. It's quite a challenge to raise your head above the parapet uh, in a small community. And I speak as someone who comes from a small island uh, originally. And even if you do raise your head above the parapet, it's often quite difficult to get um, independent inquiries or to get effective access to remedies, whether domestically or internationally, uh, in the human rights field. And given, just to highlight a couple of, of, of recent issues within the Commonwealth, the fact that the majority of Commonwealth countries still criminalise uh, LGBTI people, uh, and also the recent um, murder of Daphne Caruana Galizia in Malta, and the questions that have been raised about the inquiry uh, into that, I think highlight some of the problems. And so my question is, what can the Commonwealth do uh, to address these issues and to support respect for human rights in Commonwealth small states? Thank you very much. Caroline. <laughs> well, far be he abdicated on the previous <laughs> Well, far be it from me um, to, to tell the Commonwealth <laughs> what, what to, to do. Um, but you're a stakeholder of the Commonwealth, right? Well, that, that's true. Yeah. I, um, I am a New Zealander, and yeah. I um, grew up in a, in a small island state in the Pacific. So, um, <laughs> um, I mean, it, it seems to me that the Commonwealth can provide leadership in, in those areas in terms of you know, perhaps where it becomes too difficult for a country to deal with an issue. And I wouldn't usually advocate you know, fly in, fly out experts because I think that is disempowering. But you know, it has been, I think, a, a short term solution that is used, particularly in the Pacific, with judges from Australia and New Zealand uh, working in small jurisdictions um, to provide that additional level of independence or to, um, you know, give the benefit of a, a, a longer experience or more um, training. So I, I, I can't say whether I'm really au fait with um, Commonwealth-wide initiatives, but I know that there are um, certainly active uh, programs where p members of the Commonwealth family will help other um, you know, less equipped members of that family to work through some of those legal problems. Um, Specifically on the LGBTI um, issue, um, the Centre for Small States is working with an academic who focuses on um, same-sex marriage. Um, we're meeting up in Bermuda in, in a couple of months' time where she's, I'm um, participating in a 
discussion about the Bermudan constitution. She's going to be doing some work on same-sex marriage because obviously Bermuda recently um, repealed its same -sex, same sex its marriage equality laws. So we are tr the centre itself is trying um, to to get, provide a platform for people working in that area to share their research and hopefully through our events that will get picked up and we will have some impact there. But just to come back to that point about funding, obviously the centre, as you know, <laughs> runs on a complete shoestring um, out of my office um, in the Department of, of Law. So our contribution really has to be um, through the provision of, of academic expertise and building networks and so on. Can yeah, just, Senator, go on. Can I just add uh, to your... Uh, Susie, I think it was, yes. Um, look, I think um, one of the things that's really important is to ensure that small states um, are present and do participate. I mentioned um, in my uh, talk about uh, the presence in both Geneva and New York, and Australia has uh, strongly supported the Commonwealth States Office in both Geneva and New York, and indeed it was part of our push uh, uh, to get onto the Human Rights Council, and we've now... Um, we're a, uh, elected uh, to the council. I think it's important to have that participation because if small states are participating, if they are there at the table and their participation is facilitated in places like the Human Rights Council, um, it's important to be at the table because if you're at the table, issues pertinent to being a good international citizen are discussed then. And so that's why I think it's really important for us, countries like Australia, to support the participation of small island states um, to be at these international fora and to have their voice heard. Now, there's a positive or there could be positive things or negative things, but the important thing, if they're at the table, then that's a better chance of ensuring that that international rules-based um, agenda um, can be pursued. Patsy, you wanted to say something? Oh dear, yes. Um, <laughs> just in answer to your question, the, the LGBT issue is a big issue now in the Commonwealth. It's on the agenda. And a lot of countries now are looking at getting rid of the laws which allow it. They're ancient laws. And um, there was a time when, when the Commonwealth did a lot of, of um, training um, legal draftsmen. Well, there's not much money for that at the moment. But until you find people who can wipe out those old laws, laws which go back hundreds of years, people will still use them. But believe me, it's something that now I think might even be discussed quietly at the meeting, but not, not anything it might even be something in the communique, I don't know, but you know, the Commonwealth is full of surprises and a lot of countries now which didn't think it, it was there a problem for them now have accepted that it is a problem. And I think um, our human rights um, person is looking at me very sharply, but I think, I think the Commonwealth is aware. Would you not agree with me, David? Yes, 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 yes. And you see, you have the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. They're going around nagging every head of government they can meet. <laughs> They'll nag you. <laughs> okay, we've got a good amount of hands going up, which is great. So I'm going to have to cluster now to be um, uh, as uh, accountable as possible. So you, sir, first. Mushtaq Lishari, coordinator of All Party Parliamentary Group on Third World Solidarity, working for human rights, peace, justice, and tolerance in third world countries, but generally in Commonwealth. Can I just follow up on the point which has been already asked by the gentleman, the uh, aid? Uh, I work very closely with the DFID in 2004 and 5, and in 2005 we committed the Britain for 0.7% of our GDP by Hildy Benn, the then Secretary of State for DFID, to one of our meetings, and we have achieved. But I think it is very important, during our, our research, it was identified that more than 10 times remittance is of the aid developing world give to the countries. But there is no assistance to the people who are sending that money back, how to invest it. Because they are building big houses in which they are not going to live uh, anyway, or their children are refusing to go back. That is one point. But can I also ask that what are we going to do about the corruption? Because a lot of this aid money goes corruption. into corruption. And that is very important, because if it is not reaching to the people who need it, 
There is no need of sending it. Uh, and how many countries, if uh, Lord Bate can answer, have <laughs> achieved 0.7% of GDP to their this aid as well? Okay, uh, there's a lady over here. I haven't tried, been to the far right of the room or your far left, so yes, you. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Melinda Janke, and I'm the director of the Justice Institute in Guyana. And I just have uh, two questions, really. One was uh, in response to the human rights. I'd like to start by congratulating the UK and Australia for taking a very principled stand against the death penalty. And my question is really, um, what is the Commonwealth going to do about abolition of the death penalty, which is still prevalent in many Commonwealth countries? And my second question is really, it was sparked by um, Senator Fioravanti Fier Wells from Australia. Um, in your presentation, you talked about your responsibilities to the neighbors in the Pacific Islands, particularly the small island states. And you also talked about challenges. Um, Australia's uh, per capita emissions um, come to about 16.35 uh, metric tons. Vanuatu, it's 0 0.51, Solomon's 0 0.38, Fiji 1.5. So very, very small, and I wanted to ask really, uh, what responsibility do you think that Australia has towards the small islands um, as a result of climate change caused by the disproportionately high levels of emissions from Australia. And of course, it's a question that could also um, be addressed to the United Kingdom, which has very high emissions too. So I'm wondering whether you could say something about that and the extent to which the Commonwealth can deal with carbon emissions and take us from um, where we are right now, heading for a 1.5 degree increase to stopping that and perhaps even reversing it using greener technologies. Thank you. Thank you. So um, our, we have on the table at the moment a discussion about 0.7, quality of remittances, the issue of corruption, uh, death penalty in the Commonwealth, uh, and carbon emissions, climate change in particular. So what I will uh, ask is to go down the panel here and just choose what you want to answer, because I'm also wanting to make sure uh, that we have time for other questions. Cor corruption. So, yeah, uh, Senator. Uh, if I can just touch on uh, on your, your question, sir, about the um, uh, uh, aid and corruption, I think what is very important is that you do have mechanisms in place. Australia has um, a very strong framework in terms of its overseas development assistance in terms of ensuring uh, zero tolerance uh, to corruption and all of our programs go through um, quality assurance, if I can put it that way, and in terms of its effectiveness and efficiency. We also have what we term aid investment plans or aid um, assistance plans with different countries. We have about 25 of them which have clear indicators, clear KPIs um, and clear performance requirements um, for the period of time, whether it be three years, four years, um, in terms of that uh, that uh, terminology on the death penalty. Well, I think uh, you mentioned uh, the issue as far as uh, Australia is concerned. Can I particularly um, touch on the point um, that I think it was Melinda made uh, in relation um, to uh, issues pertinent to climate? Um, Australia has invested um, a lot in terms of climate, particularly in the Pacific, uh, as a consequence of our commitment to the Paris Agreement. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, invested, uh, we committed a billion dollars, uh, 300 million of that uh, was actually to the Pacific uh, specifically um, over four years and including a contribution to the Green Climate Fund. Australia was co-chair of the Green Climate Fund and we worked very hard to ensure that a good portion, certainly a sizable portion, um, uh, about 10% of the funds uh, went to uh, Pacific Island countries. Australia has uh, adopted um, a, a neutral uh, approach in relation to its technology. We gave a commitment at the Paris Agreement. Uh, we will be meeting our emissions targets as part of the uh, Paris Agreement and we are on track um, to meet that agreement. So uh, we are undertaking not only a domestic agenda but an international uh, agenda. But our work, particularly our work in the Pacific, um, is a very practical one. Um, it's, a, it's a program that um, 
goes towards not just uh, mitigation but um, adaptation uh, to ensure that the day-to-day, -day, if I can put it that way, the day-to-day -day, uh, assistance um, necessary for the Pacific, uh, particularly in terms of building resilience and as Lord Bates talked about, uh, building back better. Certainly the work that we've done, particularly after disaster and disaster management, but also in terms of assisting the Pacific uh, in terms of a framework for resilience and disaster preparedness uh, goes to that global, work, global um, uh, commitment that we have to preparing the region uh, for the next disaster, uh, but also ensuring that the next disaster, if we are better prepared, uh, is not going to affect uh, the people of the Pacific um, as much as the previous one did. Lord Bates. Um, just picking up first of all on the, 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 the 0.7, of course it wasn't just the UK who, who signed up to this. The OECD country signed up to 0.7% way back in, in 1970. It's nearly 50 years uh, that people have been waiting. So in a sense we were, uh, okay, well you get two cheers for, for coming late to the party <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and actually delivering what you promised that you would actually do uh, you know, in 2013-14, uh, some 40 years after uh, the pledge. So point number one is, this is we, we need to continue to advocate to those countries who uh, have not met that obligation. That, that was a commitment that we all made. Uh, and we said we would uh, we'd do it and we should uh, move towards it. Second point, which is almost going to contradict it, is to say that aid is not going to solve the problems. The SDGs, uh, you know, and you know these figures pretty well, they're, they're out there and, and well estimated. Three and a half trillion dollars uh, is the cost of actually per year of actually uh, you're implementing or getting us ready to meet the SDGs by 2030. Uh, at the moment, there's a 2.4 trillion dollar uh, gap. Total global aid flows are around 150 billion dollars. So, if we are going to actually reach the SDG targets, then we need to leverage in significant more amounts. Uh, of private sector capital. Um, so it's appropriate that, that my second chog and uh, will be, uh, I'll be leaving in about 10 minutes to go to the City of London, uh, where we'll be launching a Centre for Disaster Protect uh, uh, Preparedness, which is trying to leverage in insurance funding uh, to address some of the, the key issues to be raised. The second one is a little bit similar in the sense that if you look at the issue of corruption, then we agree that this is a serious problem and challenge uh, for, that we need to uh, address. So then you put in place significant controls about anti-money laundering uh, and against uh, and anti-corruption uh, legislation. You put it on the statute book and what happens, the financial institutions uh, that were delivering the remittances <laughs> uh, uh, then start de-risking uh, and the cost of actually sending funds back uh, to uh, two countries uh, starts to get more and more proportionately more and more uh, expensive. So these are very complex uh, issues, but the remittances, uh, uh, I mean, this has been picked up by the G20, it's been picked up by the uh, Financial Action Task Force and the Financial Stabil uh, Stability Board. So there are people there, and what we're saying is, first of all, listen, this is only going to go in one direction. I'm afraid we're not going to say that we're going to roll back on all the anti-money laundering and the anti-corruption legislation that we've done. You know, we're not going to do that. So what we need to do is we need to work with, in a similar way to we're talking about, about knowledge sharing, technical assistance, we need to help work with small island states, work with other members of the Commonwealth to actually help them to get ready uh, for that challenge. Francis. Well, um Certain things, I think the Bible says certain sinful things are always with us. And I think corruption is one of them. The issue of corruption is so widespread and difficult. I remember many years ago reading a book written by a chap who worked with the um, big American agency. And he looked into what was happening with drug money coming from Colombia and other places in the world. And in that book, he named all the banks in which this money flowed through. And I'm not going to name the banks, but it did go into the main financial centers of the world on the basis that um, 
something like, like money laundering is such a big issue that big governments can't allow it to get entirely in the hands of criminals. But the Commonwealth is aware of, of, I'm not here to speak for the Commonwealth, but I do know, having worked with them for 30 years, that it is a big problem. It is everywhere. Money is sloshing around. P people get bribed. And sometimes, you know, I have a feeling of sympathy for anybody who is running a difficult, poor country, in which there are still people who don't want change. And you try to get them to change their ways. I would think, say, the person who runs the Congo, hmm? a put-together country by a Belgian king, bigger than the size of Europe, with very few, when at independence, they had one university graduate. He probably migrated quickly. What do you do? How do you manage a country like that? Huh? And are there any Nigerians in the room? No? So I can speak? There is. Oh. There is. <laughs> yes. Well, we're, sir. we're running out of time, Patsy. <laughs> sir, we, we, uh, you have a country, and they're all, they're, the Nigeria, his name is always being called, but you have a big country put together again by the, by the empire of, of big tribes who are really countries. There are 60, 70 million in each, um, the Yorubas and so forth and so on. To manage these countries is difficult, very, very hard. And that's why corruption flourishes, okay? okay? I'm gonna take one more round of questions and I'm gonna uh, go down here, one in each block. So you, sir, first. Oh, thank you very much. My name is Sebastian Pillay. I'm an MP from the Seychelles. You don't get to be more small state than the Seychelles. <laughs> Population of 90,000. Um, it's quite interesting that on your panel, there's nobody from a small state. Uh, yeah. It's from Jamaica, right? Um, so it's very good you're from Jamaica. You, you're familiar with Seven Mile Beach in Jamaica, right? Which is now Seven Mile Beach in yes, Jamaica, yes, which yes, is now yes. going away because of coastal erosion, yes. because of climate change. Yes. The Maldives is sinking. We're losing beaches as well in the Seychelles. But yet our contribution to global pollution is nil, almost zero. So what really is commitment on the part of the Commonwealth in relation to this, and establishing perhaps what I think should be a climate change council within the Commonwealth? The second point about remittances, which is a very important issue. Currently, people living here are having problems sending their remittances back home because of the risking and loss of correspondent banking. But you've just mentioned that in the room, when you discuss, when you, when you discuss the rules, small states and those financial centers, we're not there. Uh, the US, in Delaware, is not changing its, 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 uh, its mantra. Jersey, Guernsey here in the UK is not changing its mantra. So how are you going about in establishing a forum whereby small states actually get into the room and, and brings out the point that is important for them? Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. The lady there with the very long finger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My name is Corinne McCrum. I'm an Afrophile. I started doing VSO in Nigeria and love the continent. What I wanted to ask, and it comes from being a math teacher many years ago, is what would the Venn diagram look like of the intersection of the Commonwealth small states? And you also mentioned some other categories, which I'm sorry I didn't really catch, because I guess there probably are uh, other small states which aren't part of the Commonwealth. So I would be interested in any of you know an actual picture of that to give a bit more clarity. Okay, the lady here was very patient right at the beginning. <laughs> Patience gets rewarded sometimes. Thank you Go so on. much. Um, my name is Latika Burke. I'm a journalist with the Sydney Morning Herald newspaper in Australia. Yeah. Lord Bates, my question is for you. Notwithstanding the comments you made about aid money not being able to solve all the problems and its, its quality, uh, not necessarily the quantity, uh, you are a country that has bravely Washington stared country. down populist attempts to hack into the foreign aid budget. Australia is not one of those countries. And yet Australia today is calling on Britain to do more in the Pacific, where China has embarked on a huge influence buying spending spree. Do you think Australia also has an obligation to do a bit more here? <laughs> <laughs> and um, this side uh, will have gender balance. We had two ladies, so... Two gents. You, sir. Thank, thank you, Chair. Nicholas Swartz, Institute of Commonwealth Studies. I also chair a, a SIDS partnership, learning from the sharp end of environmental uncertainty in SIDS, where we recognize the leadership exercised by SIDS, for example, Fiji in hosting three international meetings in the last year, and Seychelles, who will be represented here on Wednesday, championing the blue economy. And we really think sometimes SIDS achievements are underplayed. But, Senator, you mentioned 
getting the states to the table. And I'm sort of wondering who's at which table, because the, the Pacific Island states are underrepresented in the context of uh, civil society organizations participating. I think a minority of them are members of the foundation, the Commonwealth Foundation, which is civil society in the Commonwealth at, at one level. And so I was wondering, what efforts are made to ensure civil society engagement and whether that civil society engagement tends more to be regional, i.e. SIDS to Australia and New Zealand, and or to Commonwealth, i.e. international, but it's underrepresentation of civil society organisations in the SIDS. If you had any comments on New Zealand's role, having just heard the last question, in the, the Pacific Partnership, I'd be very interested to hear them. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that's the questions, and we're going to go down, starting with uh, Caroline, ending with the Senator, for uh, responses to questions and final thoughts. So, Caroline. And so I have a thought about the questions in terms of what was most within my expertise or my uh, jurisdiction, I, <laughs> I think. And uh, I'm going to start with the maths question. <laughs> Um, I think you're right, the majority of small states are within the Commonwealth. Uh, there are two small states in Europe, um, Cyprus and, and Malta, who are members of the Commonwealth, and then another six in Europe, um, a few others in, in Africa. Um, and then, of course, we have the larger um, states, such as Jamaica and Papua New Guinea, who are not small by population, but they, they share... Um, the characteristics of, of their smaller counterparts. But by far and away, the largest concentration of, of small states is within the Commonwealth. Um, so I, I do think it's right that we focus our attention on the Commonwealth as a driver for change. And I also wanted to say at this point um, that I recognize that there are a lot of representatives of organizations who work with small states who are interested in the um, problems and challenges faced by small states. And I want to extend an invitation to you all to contact the center to see how we might work together. Because I think one thing that we do know is that small states um, are better able to solve their problems either together as a grouping of small states or within the, um, under the umbrella of a larger organisation, and we're very happy and keen to be a part of that. That's it. Yeah, two things I want to say. There are a huge number of Commonwealth organisations which have entree and talk to governments. For instance, you, you mentioned the death penalty. There are organizations like the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, which will take up and they have access. The other thing is that um, there are, um, the organization, I should better give a plug for my organization, which is the Ramphal Center. And what we do is we try to bring to the attention of the ACP countries, Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific countries, um, the kind of research that you are doing and other organizations are doing, which affect them directly. And for instance, we did a booklet recently. We had, you know, we consulted, and we have an immense amount of support, no money, to deal with Brexit. Nobody has mentioned Brexit. The point is, all the small states are going to have to start negotiating with the cruel British government <laughs> on new trade things, on the WTO rules. Okay, the last time they did that to get the Cotonou Agreement with, with, uh, with um, the EU, it took years and years and years. And the leader of the team was my ex-boss, Sonny Ramphal, and I asked him, how's it going on? He says, the Europeans are merciless. Well, we know because of the Commonwealth, Britain won't be merciless, but that is the reality. Um, and uh, I sent, I took it on myself to send this little booklet. It wasn't, it wasn't printed very well. Um, to every head of government in the ACP countries. And I was astonished at the personal replies which came back. I didn't bother with India and Australia and Britain and so forth, thanking us because they could pass it to their civil servants who had to write and put a piece of paper before a head of government or before your UN representative how to speak up and fight your corner. Well, mate. 
Addressing the two questions that were put directly uh, to me, first of all, from our uh, colleague from the uh, Seychelles. Uh, I think that, uh, listen, as, as was said earlier, the, the Commonwealth is the best place for, for small states. This is a place in which uh, your questions and issues can be debated. It's a family. It's a, it's a, it's a community of sovereign uh, uh, states. So it's, it doesn't uh, respond well to, uh, to people uh, you're uh, lecturing people or, or taking a high moral position uh, on, on various issues from, uh, from time to time. We need to work together uh, uh, on them to actually steer uh, a path forward. And I think that's the reason why uh, it's very important that we, uh, that we operate on a position of international respect, uh, of working together, of uh, respecting our different positions where we might be uh, uh, starting from and seek to, uh, to build uh, from that. Uh, so I know that that isn't directly uh, addressing uh, uh, your uh, question, but I'm certainly not going to get into any uh, uh, debate with our, our dear friends when they've hosted such a wonderful Commonwealth Games. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> even you beat us in the netball. <laughs> we, we beat you in the netball, but we came significantly behind you in terms of uh, England, uh, anyway, in terms of the, uh, the, the medals. So, you know, it's been a wonderful thing. But we do need to respect our differences and not to fall out, but recommend that what we actually share together in terms of the big issue, the principles, the belief in democracy, in the rule of law, in the international order, our shared values throughout the Commonwealth are really what come to the fore uh, during this conference. Thank you. Okay. Senator. Thank you. Um, to the point about who participates, I think uh, one of the things um, that is important is to assist small island states to actually travel to the place where uh, a particular um, engagement uh, is happening and that's really where from our perspective certainly whether that be regionally or um, whether it be in terms of things that may happen uh, say in Geneva that we want to assist. Let me give you just a couple of examples. Um, in the last uh, year or so I've attended two uh, international uh, engagements where we have from the Australia and as part of our ODA have actually assisted uh, p uh, participants from small island states in the Pacific to actually travel to participate. On the regional level, and we did this very much in the, as part of the COP23, and I have to say having Fiji um, have the presidency of COP23 I think was really important because it gave, gave a very distinct uh, perspective in terms of um, the issues that are faced by uh, small island uh, states. But we supported participation of civil society uh, at the regional level. And often um, it does need to be at a regional uh, level, uh, particularly in relation for travel or other issues. But I think that where possible, in addition to regional participation, it does need to be at the international level. And that's the point that I was making uh, before. Uh, on the point that uh, Latika um, made, um, just a, a couple of things. Um, three points if I can. Uh, one is that um, from Australia's perspective, we have not prescribed a percentage of GNI that uh, will be uh, the aid uh, budget. Having said that, we did increase uh, overseas development assistance uh, in the last year and have now uh, put it, um, frozen it uh, for uh, over the, um, the next couple of years. The issue though, whether it's Australia or any other country, becomes one of taking your uh, public with you. And what's really, and this is an issue that I will be exploring this afternoon at the um, uh, talk I will give. Uh, in Australia, we had some uh, research done uh, where it showed that 80% of Australians believed that the uh, foreign assistance, the aid that we were giving was sufficient uh, or was too much. That is compared to, if I can put it, the aid, people who are work in the aid sector uh, believe that there is not sufficient aid. There is, and, and we're talking a big um, uh, schism between those two uh, percentages. So what is vitally important is that you do take the public with you. And that's really, since I became minister, um, we haven't focused, I didn't want the debate to just be focused on what we do it's important to understand the why, but also what is the direct benefit to your country 
in providing overseas development assistance. So in Australia's case, the fact that we provide 90% of our ODA to our region, it's not just focusing on what we do. Why are we doing it? We are doing it because we want a stable, secure and prosperous region. What is the direct benefit to Australia? Because if we do have a stable, secure and prosperous region, then that is second only to the defence of Australia. So when you, you have to take the public with you on this issue, and that's why part of this on the aid issue is actually uh, the, your public, whether it's the Australian public or the British public or any other public, they have to understand the what, the why, but more importantly, what is the direct benefit of overseas development assistance? So that's really where I think that in Australia, um, and that's not just something that we as a government can do, it's civil society, it's, it's business, um, it's a whole range of different things, and that's why Australia's commitment to us, um, is to the SDG, and we are now this year going to provide our voluntary national review, and as part of that, we will really be doing a bit of an audit of where we're at. But in the end, um, that's really where, from Australia's perspective, uh, it needs to be a combined effort, but you need to take everyone with you. Senator, thank you very much. I've got three things to do. Uh, first one is just to uh, draw your attention that uh, the Africa program at Chatham House on Wednesday is hosting a meeting with the president of the Seychelles, Danny Four, who will be speaking on strengthening institutions for development lessons from the Seychelles. So we've heard several uh, comments today and discussions about the Seychelles. This meeting is going to be a particularly about what is the learning from the Seychelles for other small island states in particular. If you're interested in that meeting, it's on the 18th of April, 11.30 to 12.30, and there's information on the site there uh, which you can take away and please register. There are seats still for that. The second thing is to thank the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. Sanjoy, thank you very much for partnering with us on this very successful meeting. It's a pleasure to work with you. And thirdly, and most important, it's can we all thank this marvellous panel for spending an hour and 15 minutes with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>